A very good morning, everyone, and you're welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Mark Gibson, and today we're also joined by Pat Murphy, who's going to be helping us out with questions later on. Uh, welcome, Pat. Uh, the Signpost series is brought to you by Chagas Connected in association with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National Rural Network and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. In Ireland, all water policy and management is led by the Water Framework Directive. And under this, the country has been set a target of achieving good status for all its waters. However, despite a lot of work, good work over the last 20 to 30 years, we're still falling short in achieving this target. Uh, the ASA program, uh, which is known as the Agricultural St Sustainability Support and Advisory Program, is working with farmers in a free and confidential advisory service to help improve water quality. And to give us an update on the ASAP program this morning, we're delighted to be joined by Noel Meehan, who is manager of the ASAP program, and also Joe Crockett, a coordinator of the Dairy Sustainability Ireland. Gentlemen, you're welcome to this morning's uh, webinar. Thanks, Mark. Joe, can you hear us okay? I think you're on mute there. So just uh, maybe, Noel, you're coming to us from uh, Galway as well. How's all in, in uh, East Galway? Um, well, it's, it's glorious out there this morning, as, as it is, I'm sure, in most of the country. So all is good, Mark. Thanks. Yeah. Great. And uh, Joe, no guessing uh, where you're coming from this morning with your beautiful background of the, the castle there. How's all down in Kilkenny? All perfectly beautiful as ever. Great. Please, Great. Please. Okay. So... Um, uh, Joe, or sorry, Noel, I think you're going to lead us off with this morning's presentation and you're going to give us an update on progress within the ASA program. Uh, and then, Joe, you're going to give us uh, an update on the, 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 the more policy side uh, and uh, the, 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 the future of uh, bonus schemes from, from the cooperative perspective. And Pat, uh, you're going to join us then for questions afterwards. So a reminder to everybody, please do send us your questions uh, uh, during the, the, the presentation uh, that we can put to uh, Noel and Joe at the end of uh, their, their presentations. So Noel, uh, we'll hand directly over to yourself. But just before we do that, to remind everybody that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Chagas website and the Chagas YouTube channel. So if you want to pick up the, a copy or PDF of today's presentation, that will be available on the website in the next number of days. So Noel, we'll uh, hand straight over to you and uh, we will talk to you in a little bit. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Um, I presume everybody can, can see the screen okay? Yeah, that's perfect, Joe. Uh, Noel, we can see that clearly. Okay, lovely. Um, so look, at, thanks to the Signpost uh, series for uh, giving us the opportunity to talk here this morning, myself and Joe. And uh, I suppose um, I just need to, want to start, obviously, by just acknowledging all the, the players and all the partners and all the people who are who are heavily involved in the ASAP program. So, you know, obviously the, the dairy co-ops as outlined there. And obviously we have a partner in Law Pro who are providing us with the science for the cash for in each PAA and then the funders from the local um, from the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage and the Department of Agriculture. And Dairy Sustainability Ireland are uh, on behalf of the co-ops there. So just to give a quick uh, outline of the presentation, just going to go through a little bit of progress to date. Um, previous webinars, I would have given a lot of data, but this one is going to be a lot, lot more tone back on data just to give a, a quick upshot where we are with, with progress. But I want to really focus on advisor farmer interaction and, and implementation of measures. So we have a couple of case studies that I'm going to go through with you. And, and there's a there's a, um, the upper deal, there's, a, there's an EIP in there that, that has something law for heavily involved in and the co-ops are heavily involved in. And then there's another example there in the Dicer 10, um, which I would have spoken about before, but I think it's, it's, it's worth revisiting again. Um, just a little bit of innovation that, that you know, ASAP and LawPro have um, pulled together uh, and a focus on diffuse nitrate loss in particular, and I'll, I'll just bring that to the to the meeting. And, and also, we we conducted an external review on ASAP just really to see where we are and where we're going. Uh, so I think it's worth uh, mentioning that as well. And then a look ahead to the, cycle, the third cycle that we're we're currently in. So we'll, we'll progress along there. So as of today, just in July, just over 3,143 farms have been assessed with 755 follow-up visits. So we're continuing to do the farmer meetings. Um, we're active in nearly uh, 124 um, PAAs. Um, and 
what's really encouraging is is this figure here of 96 percent engagement that hasn't really changed much at all since the start of the program which is a testament to, to the farmers and also a testament to you know that the the engagement process that's that's there and also to the support that we're getting from the farming uh, uh farming body so you know the, the very farming farming organizations there uh, out there um among the membership and they're promoting assets to the membership so that's very much appreciated um, we're getting good agreement on proposed measures, um, 93%. So I suppose the agreement is one thing, the implementation is another. And that's that's where we have to uh, get get more implementation of measures going on. And I'll explain that in a little while. On average, we're finding about five issues per farm. So it's not like there's, there's massive uh, issues out there, but there is, you know, massive numbers, but there is issues out there. And, you know, what we're trying to find out is, as I mentioned, the implementation of measures. So what we're finding is that of the high risk measures that we have asked farmers to, to uh, the high risk issues that we've asked the farmers to do measures on, um, there's implementation going on of about 62%. So that's where farmers have either started it or completed it, or it's an ongoing basis where it might be a practice change. Um, so obviously on, on the on the converse, we have, a, we have 38% where we haven't seen any progress or, or, or maybe farmers might have changed their mind on, on, a, on a particular mitigation action. So, and that's for a number of reasons, I suppose, you know, it takes time to come back and, and reassess these farms and see if they've actually uh, started to implement these measures. Um, you know, they may be waiting for the new acre scheme to come along to uh, avail us some funding there to compensate uh, them from for uh, the measures they're going to put in because ASAP as it stands currently, um, we don't we don't have any money to give to farmers. So it's it's pretty much voluntary what they're doing and out of their own pocket. So that's important to know. So look at that's that's a figure that we want to get down lower uh, and we're working very hard to do that. And just to just to note as well that you know the the number of advisors target set of twenty, but it's important to note that the, the co-ops have have um, increased their numbers to sixteen currently, and there will be the plan is, is is to increase it to eighteen by the end of this year. So you know the co-ops that's from a, that's from an original uh, number of ten. So look, that's very important to, to note that the co-ops have have really um, acknowledged the role that they have to play in improving water quality. Um, so look at a lot of data on this. I won't dwell on it too long. Uh, what we're looking at here is, you know, the pressures have remained the same. It's it's pretty much three quarters from the diffuse uh, P uh, nitrogen sedimentation with with uh, point sources uh, at fourteen percent and other issues around toxicity and, and ammonium there as well. So those pressures have remained pretty much uniform all through the year, all through the the program so far. And just to break down on, on the enterprise that we've assessed, so you know, with with a strong emphasis on dairy uh, from the co-ops, we have thirty-two percent of farms or dairy uh, have been assessed by the dairy co-ops. Thirty-seven percent is our beef production, um, sheep at seven, uh, tillage at four percent, and other and mixed farming. Then so that could be a combination of cattle and sheep, or she, uh, beef and tillage, or dairy and tillage. And just finally, then on, on, on the stats, uh, the high risk, pretty most frequent high risk issues that we're finding. And again, these haven't really changed, so no, nothing different there. It's, it's the diffuse losses. It's the diffuse loss of phosphorus from overland flow, um, drinking point stream fencing, adding, bringing, bringing sedimentation and, and nutrification, uh, the application of buffers or the non application of buffers, and then around nutrient management. So, so those are the top five. And, and to be honest, those haven't really changed at all since the start of the program either. So it's quite consistent what the problems are and we, we know where they are. We know what, what needs to be done to rectify them. So I, as I said, I wanted to talk about um, implementation and uh, getting farmers to do things. And I suppose one, what, one, of, one of the things that has been done is, is um, Law Pro and ASAP and supported by Ballyhura uh, Development Company. They lodged uh, an application for uh, eighty thousand funding to the department for a mini EIP. I think this this is a you know a great idea and and you know credit to the the the, the, the lads in Law Pro and obviously from Chaga side of uh, Emer Connery and Barry Fitzgerald and um, in the co-op side uh, Terry O'Mahony. They put their weight behind this and they saw it as a great opportunity to try and. Get a few, get some funding for farmers to implement key measures uh, that would help improve water quality in that upper deal area. They selected two mini catchments, two catchments out of the deal. Uh, so the deal water, the deal PAA is quite uh, is a six or eight uh, water body uh, PAA, 
was it just picked two? So uh, the deal, this is the deal 20 and this is the deal 50 as, as far as I know. And so the cork limerick border. And it's very heavy soils catchment with phosphorus and sediment issues throughout. Um, and what they were, the project was to do was, was targeting um, biodiversity measures in, in particular areas, basically targeting them to where you have overland flow pathways and delivery points uh, into the drainage network and trying to match um, suitable buffers or riparian margins or, or various mechanisms to uh, minimize sediment and phosphorus loss in these areas. So the partners, um, important to note, is Bali Hara Development, Asset Law Pro, Donald Daly, I'm sure, is familiar to a lot of the, of, of the people on, on this call, OPW and the Inland Fisheries Ireland. So they've been actually working there and, you know, engagement with about 90% of the landowners. So that's 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 very positive um, bit of work, but it, it is, um, and I've talked to the advisors about this, that they, that they, did know, they did say to note that it takes a lot of engagement, a lot of time, you know, they've gone to farmers two, three, four times, um, you know, from initially making the call to identifying the problems to, you know, getting the farmer on board to uh, sorting out an application for funding uh, to getting them implemented. So it, it takes time. So, you know, it's on the go about a year now and, the, and it's only really at this stage that it's getting going and, you know, it's, it's finishing up fairly soon. But, you know, they could really do another six, six to 12 months more to, to really see it out. But look, that's the time frame they have, they have. So look, you know, really it, it's a year to two years to get get traction and get movement in a, in a, in a water body or in a, in a project like this. So this is just an example of, of one of the one of the bit of works that's gone in there. Um, as you can see, this is just one of the EPA uh, maps, the overland flow pathway maps. Um, and you can see the, the hatched areas is where the water starts to flow across the, across the landscape. Uh, this is the actual river here but uh, there is a, a fairly major uh, drain draining all this area going off down here and joining the river up here. So the measure that was decided was to try and put in a, a wetland pond, as you can see here on the right hand side. Uh, this is newly constructed, it was literally gone in, I think in the last two or three weeks. Um, and the idea is, is that, you know, this would catch the overland flow of water um, and, you know, act as a kind of a settlement pond or, or a filtration pond that the nutrients and sediments settle out before joining the, the drainage network and the outfall to the main drain. Um, it's also planned to obviously, you know, the opportunity here then is to add in a bit of biodiversity in nature. So they're going to obviously plant it up with native trees, but also they're going to go farther than, than the, um, than the, uh, the pond. They're going to uh, plant the flow pathway back up the way a little bit as well to provide that extra bit of buffering and extra bit of protection. What they're also going to do is they're going to, um, the farmer is going to do some drainage works on it as well uh, on that farm because it's, 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 it's heavy ground. So, you know, in consulta consultation with the advisor, they've decided to uh, divert the drainage channels directly into this uh, pond as well first. So again, to act as a settlement pond. And obviously, if, you know, they, they have going to put the 12, 12 inches of, of topside over the drainage just to give that added layer of protection. Uh, not, they are not going to bring it to the surface. It's bad practice. They're going to put that 12 inches of soil to give protection to the water or to the drain. Noel, can uh, I just ask in relation to the ponds there, is there yeah. a plan to have a continuous management of that at a later stage? Is there a risk that that could become a, a sink of, of phosphate um, given that you have, um, you know, uh, waters, you know, slowing water down there? Is that is that something? Like yeah. So, like, I suppose it 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 it'll, it'll I suppose it, they'll have to see. Um, initially, I don't think there's any real plan on on that to be to be fair, Mark. I think what this will do is is it will um, you know they shouldn't after a period of time there shouldn't be much sediment in that. You know, it's going to be a, a managed field. There's going to be a good buffering. You know, that all that brown area there is going to be planted, so you're going to have a lot of buffering there to trap sediment and phosphorus coming across. Uh, anything that's left over will will go to the go to the wetland pond plus the drainage work that they're going to do. Again, you're going to have that twelve inches of, of topsoil over the drain, so you shouldn't be getting too much phosphorus down through that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there shouldn't be too much sediment coming down through that either. So you know, it's it's more just to trap any excess water. It's kind of a, a water retention feature as well. You know, to to okay, you know, yeah. from a flood, flood prevention point of view. So it, it, 
I, I would say they'll have to watch it, but I, I don't expect that it's going to be overloaded with sediment or phosphorus because of the other works that they're trying to do here to to um, to capture that as well before sure. it gets into that pond, you know? Yeah, well, that, that makes okay. sense. Thanks. Okay. Um, and just another example here um, where farmers have been asked to fence off areas of counter native trees. So you have an area up here. Again, it's it's the, the fall is is to this point and there's a drain along here that goes off. And this is the this is the pictures of it. So you can you can quite I hope you can see it in the photograph. There's a quite a good fall all the way down to that point. That's all the way down here to that point there. Uh, and it does get quite wet that spring to show you know the water really gets gets clogged up there. So that's what you would call a critical source area. And the plan there is to plant off uh, fence off 0.3 of a hectare and uh, three quarters of an acre. Uh, plant with native trees and to uh, to you know um, manage the critical source area in that way. It's 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 low productivity land anyway, and you know the farmer is happy to do that, and he's going to get a, a compensation for that. And the same up here on this point here is another area that's going to be fenced off. So this is the one farm. So it, it kind of stretches from this point to this point here. That's the one farmer. So look, that's 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 really really positive work that's been done out there, and you know it can can show what can be done where uh, you have good farmer engagement. Um, and I think you, you know that these are things that without financial compensation, farmers would be less willing to do. You know, they might do something for you, but they wouldn't miss necessarily maybe put in a pond or, or maybe fence off. They might fence off a much smaller area than three quarters of an acre, you know, for, for the purposes of, of water protection. So I think it's, it's just important to note that as well. Um, one final example here, uh, this is, is again from um, the Upper Deal, it's, it's a stretch of river down along here, um, and this, this, this farmer here owns this bit of ground, um, so he's going to fence off all this river and he's going to install three water troughs to provide water uh, supply, and, and they obviously are going to be 20 metres away because of, of the regulations. But um, unfortunately that's the way the river is at the minute, so as you can see it, it certainly needs a lot of work and it needs to be fenced off. And cattle access needs to be needs, needs to be prevented. So again, this is a money that is going to be well spent by uh, the EIP into, into prevention. Um, you know, obviously there's quite a lot of sedimentation, cattle access, bank erosion, all that kind of stuff. So that there's a plan in place there to to try and fence it off and and uh, try and uh, protect that river and uh, provide an alternative drinking supply because that's very important from the farmer's point of view. So the second case study then is just Loch Enel, uh, Dysert 10 in Loch Enel, and I would have spoken about this before, but I think it's worth revisiting again. Um, the problem there was uh, Loch Enel is a bathing water uh, and it was being impacted by pathogen losses from agriculture. So this is your E. coli. Um, and also there was a few phosphorus and sediment losses also impacting. And this is the water body here in purple and it flows into Loch Enel. And I don't know if who, listeners might be familiar with it, but lily put uh, bathing waters is, is just just here at the top of uh, at the bottom of uh, Loch Inn. So it's very popular bathing water, but it was in danger of being of losing its bathing water status because of impacts from pathogens in particular. And uh, you can just maybe see in the graph, this is for 2018-2019, that at the bottom there you have the blue line, that's the that's the sufficient water quality. So Anthony above the line is poor, so Anthony up here is poor, and you can see. You know, particularly during the bathing water season, which is June, July, August, um, you're getting spikes of pathogens, E. coli, and that's probably you know to do with uh, summer spreading of, of slurry, heavy rainfall events, and they're getting washed off into the drainage network. And you can see quite high spikes on, on that. So you know something needed to be done quite quickly. And uh, the asset advisor, so that's uh, David Webster and Niall McLaughlin, uh, I think is, is was up there in um, that area. From Lakeland, uh, they visited 23 farms based on law per referrals breakdown of 19 beef and four dairy farmers. And the issues identified were diffuse pea and sediment losses, surface runoff uh, from the land leading to uh, leading to sediment pea losses, and also you know that was going to bring your pathogens with with it as well. Cattle access and drainage maintenance were the issues that they identified. So you know the mitigation advice. We kind of broke it down to two, you know, there's regulatory advice that's there and maybe sometimes you just need to remind farmers of the obligations from a regulatory point of view and that was around adherence to buffer zones and compliance with fertilizer limits and compliance with the organic manure storage and close periods as well. Um, but then the voluntary actions were around riparian margins and management of critical source areas. 
um, prevention of cattle access to waters. You know, if you're, you know, dairy farmers may have to prevent them, but other farmers don't, might, might not be in, in environmental schemes either. Um, and then a, a, an information or education part as well to farmers on, on drain maintenance. And there's a right way and a wrong way and a right time and a wrong time to do this. And it was important to, to uh, um, educate farmers on that. So some work stuck on in a, a, a soil water tank, you know, solar power drinkers have gone in, um, fencing off of water courses, you know, better buffer margins and low emission slurry spreading. Uh, again, better buffer margins from uh, for for slurry spreading and, and obviously then allowing the, the buffer margin to vegetate up as well. Uh, so they were the kind of measures that were needed to, to go in there. And um, this is the same graph as before, but now we've included 2020 and 21 data. So again, the green and the yellow is, is 2018, 2019. Uh, 2020 is the is the RNG ready one. So you can see that you know there was a little bit of a spike, but it, it plateaued off in in uh, for the rest of the year, and then 2021 is the purple line here down the bottom. So this is well below the blue line that's uh, that indicates sufficient water quality. So I think it's worth just pointing that out that you know from talking to farmers and getting farmers to engage and um you know some some uh structural work has gone in obviously fencing and 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 uh solar power drinking and that kind of thing but you know most of it was was um was voluntary by the farmer so you can see how when when we do get an engagement we can see that there are uh, positive results so very quickly because i'm running out of time already um so we with the increase in dairy co-op advisors team to, to, to 18 advisors and obviously then we're well aware that um there is a nitrate uh you know problem where elevated levels of nitrogen are in the south and southeast area um you know we felt that there was an opportunity there to do something about um providing greater advice and greater access to farmers around nitrogen and um we needed to provide referrals to these advisors to keep them to keep them working um, you know law pro staff has remained at the same level so we needed to come up with a new idea as to how we were going to do this and the idea came around creating a, a, a referral for nitrogen and this was primarily developed by law pro um, and this would allow ASPA advisors to visit farms in PAAs and in selected water bodies with elevated nitrate areas. So you have the, 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 the typical or the traditional PAAs, but also other areas where you have high nitrate levels. And then provide mitigation advice on nitrate losses. And this is also relevant as well for tillage farmers and dry stock farmers. So the Chagos advisors will be looking at that. So the catchment refers for nitrogen um, we've developed has been developed for 1,231 water bodies across the south and east. I'll show you where those are in a minute. Um, they are on a priority basis, um, so we will work, uh, continue to work where, where, where for, where the priority will be the traditional uh, law pro referral, but we can also, once those are uh, looked after, we can move on to these uh, cash from referrals for nitrogen. And we have them broken down into three different categories, so water bodies contributing High nitrogen within catchments of concern, so there's 400 of those. High PIP in areas um, in the catchments of concern, but not including above, is over 700. And then water bodies with elevated nitrogen outside the catchments of concern. And I'll show you where those are now in a second. So the first priority are the dark green ones. These are the ones where there's elevated levels of, of nitrogen that, that we are going into. Uh, first priority where we need to try and reduce the nitrate levels. But um, these are all part of bigger water bodies, so the green areas would, would be where the water uh, levels, concentration of nitrogen aren't as high, but when you add them together bit by bit by bit, they do lead to a, an elevated downstream, so we need to obviously work on those as well, so they're the second priority. Then outside the catchments are concerned that the EPA would have highlighted, there are a number of water bodies where there is elevated levels of nitrogen, so across the midlands there, um, Offaly, North Tipperary, uh, over in Dublin and Wexford primarily. So I think they're they're a really good uh, idea. Um, they're putting a focus on nitrogen. Uh, they're putting a bit of direction for advisors and where to go. Uh, we have spoken about, you know, we, we trained advisors and, and, and talked to advisors about where the focus should be and what the mitigations actions are. So I think it's a very positive um, development and the co-ops uh, are obviously very much engaged in this as well. 
Um, very quickly again, we had an, an expert review of ASAP carried out last year, basically to do a comprehensive assessment of ASAP, uh, make recommendations for the future development of the programme uh, and see where we go. Uh, we had a, a, a quite a, a, a strong panel of members, uh, I'll let you read through the names there yourselves, uh, but they all had a, an area of expertise and they all cont contributed fantastically to it. Uh, this was carried out uh, this time last year. There was 10, um, 10 high level findings and recommendations. Uh, you know, um, unfortunately, I won't have time to go through them all here today, but it's primarily around um, you know, the focus of, of ASAP to maintain, to, re to stay as uh, on water quality, um, you know, we spoke about uh, funding, um, you know, funding mechanism, uh, tying in with the mainstream advisory service um, and making sure that we, we do continuous kind of readjusting and reevaluation of what we're doing in the, P, in the PAAs. And also, you know, recording and reporting mechanism need to be improved. Um, so, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, these will be available on website and you can have a look through them yourselves uh, at a later date. Okay, I'll jump to that. So, um, just to just to kind of final slide from me. Um, implementation of mitigation, mitigation actions is key to realizing water quality improvements. We know that we can see in the deal where we have finance. We can see in, you know farmers are are prepared to uh, do stuff and get get things done and and maybe go over and beyond the kind of the. the uh, more better mitigation actions that are out there. So that's important. Um, so on the back of that, uh, we made a case to, to both the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Housing uh, around getting some additional funding for farmers to compensate them for putting in measures. And, and I think great credit is due to both departments uh, for uh, announcing funding of 60 million over five years for water quality EIP. So that's kind of in, in the gestation period at the minute. And the fund will provide farmers uh, with, with money to implement measures. So, you know, this will be this will be very important. Uh, it'll be available to you know farmers and PAAs and other water quality initiatives, not necessarily just ASAP, but other water quality initiatives as well that are out there. The catchment referrals for nitrogen, you know, are very much a new and innovative approach to tackling the, the diffuse nitrogen problem. But do we need to maybe think about doing something similar for phosphorus? That's a question that we, we've been thinking about in, in ASAP. Uh, can we, and, and with Law Pro, um, can we uh, look at doing something like this uh, so that we can, we can um, expand the reach and, and, and up the pace? But look, that's all very much dependent on, on, on a number of factors, whether it's possible to do such a thing, and obviously then uh, funding and, and, uh, and numbers and things like that. We all know that there's been a very much a, a strengthening of the gap regulations there in March, uh, so you know they would help the situation. Um, and then, obviously, as well, we need to expand the use of the EPA pip mass, and they're very much fundamental to the water quality measures in acres. I think that's positive because it will, it will certainly bring them more mainstream for more advisors, and they get more familiar with them. That can only be a positive because the maps are very useful, and they give great direction. And you know, hopefully, that will help from a water quality point of view. And we're working. Uh, very hard to get a farm sustainability planner developed as well. So development advisory tools, and that would be, you know, for water quality and biodiversity and greenhouse gases as well. And finally, um, you know, we've done a lot of work uh, with our partners and colleagues as well in Law Pro and, and the departments and the EPA around the National Agricultural Inspections Program. It's something that was very much highlighted by the uh, EU decision. Uh, with regard to the uh, derogation around inspection programs and around um, enforcement of measures. So I suppose from an asset point of view, uh, we, need, we, we need to be able to um, work with farmers, but from a, go a, um, a government point of view, they need to be able to carry out their inspection programs. So we've engaged with them in that, and I think we have a, we have a plan in place where we can all work well together on that. So I'll just put that up there for a finish. Um, this was before this man became king, but he was down in, in a farm in Warford um, earlier on in the year and he spoke with some signpost advisors and, and obviously with, with Carl Summers there from, from, uh, from ASAP. So I leave the questions till after Joe, I think, Mark. Okay, that's, that's great, uh, Noel. Thank you so much for that. Um, 
great example of of an evidence based approach to targeting measures. Um, really, really excellent program, and I, I think huge acknowledgement must go out to all of the farmers that have engaged in the program um, and all of the the ASAP advisors across the country who are developing those positive relationships. Um, so look, we'll come back to some of the questions yeah. after Joe's presentation, but uh, it was great to see that funding coming on stream through the EIP, uh, a direct result of a, a, a recommendation from the ASAP program. So uh, that that's much needed funding. I mean, we've all seen that over the years that that has been a a, a, a stumbling block for implementing some of the measures on farms. So, so uh, Joe, you're going to maybe talk to us a little bit about uh, the, the, the the thinking that's going on at, at a cooperative level. Um, so if you could just sh share your screen with us, it's great to see huge turnout today. We've got nearly 300 uh, participants this morning, so uh, huge interest in this topic. Okay, guys, can you see my screen? Yeah, that looks great, Joe. Great stuff. Okay, we get started. Okay, thanks very much, Nate. Um, okay. Um, I suppose what I want to talk is about firstly is the context in which ASAP sits. Uh, and clearly everybody is familiar with the new ask of the agri sector to deliver a 25% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions to bring it down to the 16.5 million tons. Uh, and that's obviously a big area of focus for urban Ireland uh, and all of Ireland is very focused on energy reduction at the present time. So there's a lot happening in this space uh, and you know, very significant changes for every sector of society, including agriculture. That's what we've got to deliver. Uh, and that's what we've got to now move on to implementation on once various uh, kind of reports or, or various kind of reports are signed off. But we equally have a major challenge in relation to water quality. It is the case that agri pressures and waters have been increasing against the backdrop of, a, of urban wastewater pressures reducing because of huge investment by the state. And as Noel has mentioned, uh, and on the back of the LOPO and the EPA science maps that you'd have seen, NXS is a particular problem uh, for dairy and, and the semi drought conditions that we've had have added to the kind of the, the intensity of that in the current year. Um, I suppose we're also coming to a new recognition about PXS uh, in, in, in the area that's kind of left of the line from Dundalk to Court Mac Sherry, that this is something as well that, that on the beef side that we, that we also have, there has been movement on and that we collectively all have to try to, not try, but actually we have to fix both climate and we have to fix water in the same way as urban wastewater is fixed and in the same way as other kind of any other pressures are also fixed. Ammonia happily is stabilizing, which is kind of good news. Biodiversity stuff is improving, but more to be done. And we know that the kind of the structures of the cap payment system are changing in the light of the fit for 55 and in the light of, of the EU movement in relation to the uh, uh, in relation to climate change targets. And it is the case across Europe, for example, that water is gone into short supply in an awful lot of places. And if we are blessed by our environment to have such good supplies of water in a temperate climate, which enables grass to be grown in, in, here in New Zealand in a, in, a, in a way that is so carbon efficient, that it makes perfect sense for us to take greater care of the huge resource that water is, as well as kind of the huge resource that our land is and our forestry is and our climate is. So this is kind of what cap restructuring is now moving to support. Now the Dairy Vision Group is looking, uh, has been looking at what are the steps that have to be taken or that should be taken to get us to that climate change target of 25%. And there's some good stuff in there, but it's to be signed off. And then we can move on to implementation. Clearly, dairy, uh, dairy has sort of been receiving um, sort of significant PR challenges over the course of the past while. Again, I think sort of in some respects, partially fairly, one could say, because it is a case of water quality is, is under pressure uh, from both dairy and beef and from tillage. Um, but it is also the case that our climate is designed for the growing of grass. Um, and that means then that we can produce, that the humble cow can produce good quality cheese and whey and milk and specialized nutrition for old age and for athletes and for babies and so on and so forth, which is a unique thing that we can do better than anywhere else. And I think that is something, and it also is kind of holding up the economy of, of rural Ireland in a way that very few other things are doing. But at the same time, we, that does add another responsibility on us that we do have to 
if we want license to continue to produce, we must fix climate and we must fix water and we must fix ammonia and we must improve on biodiversity and get that really right. But the good news is that all of these things are eminently fixable. Uh, and that's what gives me great, oh, sorry, excuse me, stop. That's what gives me great optimism. And I think we should be optimistic for the future that in the line that in the light of the um, of the kind of the great improvements that were made by virtue of food harvest and food wise, where the entire agri sector was mobilized to to help the economy was uh, and to help ourselves from such trouble. So our sector has a great track record of success, and I think we can now mobilize in the same way to address these particular sustainability challenges and overcome them. Um, so, uh, hello, no, yeah, so this is the next slide. Um, so ASAP is a unique industry government cooperation. It has been expanded this year by the co-ops in light of the ASAP recommend of the external review team recommendation. There is very good cooperation among all the agencies, which is a very hard thing to achieve. Uh, and trust has continued to build up amongst us all. And again, it is fair to acknowledge the funding of the Department of Housing and the Department of Agriculture as well as of the co-ops themselves. And that's, uh, that's what keeps the program going. So it is a good model and it is a develop, it, it is part of a developing cool toolkit to support farmers and suppliers to improve water, climate, biodiversity, ammonia, and to achieve chemical fertilizer reduction. Now, even in the news yesterday, there was great focus on the fact that Russia is not allowing sort of fertilizer production across the world. So I think that it, we need to re, examine our attitudes to slurry to say, look, this is an, ex an exceptionally rare resource and it should be husbanded and used better than it has perhaps been used up to now. Now, it is also the case of further structural changes on the way on all aspects of sustainability. And, you know, we have to be agile and we have to be proactive and we have to own these kind of issues and, you know, make the change and get on with it and get things done and, 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 and fix it. And that protects our, our the economies and, and the economic gains that we've already made, which are which have been significant to task said. And again, part of the great success story for rural Ireland. Um, sorry. So I just want to talk briefly about the sustainability payments, which is kind of another tool that's emerging. Uh, this is Carberry's one. And it, it, it you know, these are the different elements that you know, in terms of people getting a little bit of, of, of being paid to do sustainability stuff. So those are the different elements that Carberry have at the present time, and they've introduced that this, uh, earlier this year. Um, dairy Gold have a system in as well, and that's the Dairy Gold kind of reasoning as to why they have a particular focus on, on the sustainability pay payment system. Um, and, that's the different, and that adds to these other kind of components that they also have around Vestas and milk recording and herd health bonus uh, and all of that. Kerry's Evolve program is also there, and this is what it focuses on. And you can see that it, 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 that all these programs have different areas of focus, but they're all moving towards the same thing ultimately. Uh, and in terms of, of, of pay of farmers and suppliers being paid to do good stuff. And I think that is it, it's kind of very beneficial to everybody. Um, and even here with the with the Kerry Evolve program, and likewise, you'll have seen it on the Carberry program that in relation to encouraging and incentivizing a switch to the use of protected urea to help water quality. Uh, Tier Lawn, which is formerly Glombia, uh, there again, this is a very recent uh, production by them. And you can see that their commitments just on the bottom line uh, and their, you know, the, the 18 million that they are bringing forward for, for payments to suppliers and that level of payment, that amount of money is kind of common to all of the co-ops you'll have seen that they're, you know, it's double digit uh, payments for farmers to do this stuff. So if you add up the commitment that this all means, plus the commitment that, that of the cost of asset, these are kind of significant and meaningful um, developments by the, by the co-ops and by the processors with more to come. So that's just a gist of it. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. I hope that was a bit helpful. Well, thank you, Joe. That was an excellent overview of what's happening at, at a cooperative level. And I think you, you talked about having that, that, that ownership of, of the issues by farmers is so important. And I think really is happening out on the ground. 
Could I ask you, Joe, just that, I mean, the levels of payments that are being offered under those programs, do you think are they sending a strong enough signal back uh, to the farm gate? I mean, I think you mentioned one cent per litre there as a, an incentive by one of the, the cooperatives. I think we're on the start of a journey here. I mean, we're seeing the cap payments being, uh, the cap system being uh, restructured now to, to get it for farmers to be paid to do sustainability stuff. And the government and all of the party leaders have been very strong to say the state will support farmers to do this kind of good stuff. Mm-hmm. And clearly the, um, the schemes that we've seen over the course of the past while are going to evolve further and the other co-ops will be bringing on, 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 on systems as well. So as we try to tackle the kind of the big ticket issues like climate and water and biodiversity, you could even go into kind of energy conservation and so on and so forth and deforestation that these will all be part of the new toolkit that will be there linked alongside the, uh, the, the, the good work that Chagas is doing on the, on the St. Paul's Farms programme uh, and, and, and the good work that farmers themselves are doing. So I think between us all, there is, as I said, I, I'm optimistic about the way that this can all move too, but it, it will require, I think, over the course of the coming two or three months, kind of a movement away from policy analysis and policy development into implementation. Uh, and that the quicker we get to implementation, the quicker we will address these issues because there will be time lags from the time that you do the implementing stuff to the time that the science will reflect the actions that have been taken. So I think that the quicker we move now from reports and thinking and talking into action, that's the next kind of strategic set of steps that we need to take. On top of the, all the work that has been done up to now, because ESTAS, for example, has been very has been a very, very good program. And there's been very good programs that have been done under all of the department schemes that, that, that have been very strong and all the Jaga schemes. So look, it's on to the next iteration is kind of really where we need to, to get to and, and into the next stage of implementation. I was, I was speaking to some colleagues in Greece um, who, who actually visited one of the ASAP farms there last week. Uh, kindly hosted uh, by uh, Deirdre Glynn and, and Carl Summers, and they were hugely impressed with the uh, the cooperation that's going on across all of the different, between public and private uh, agencies. Uh, I, I know representatives from Law Pro were there as well. So it's, it look, it's a good news story. Uh, Noel, a question coming through there in relation to the, uh, the monitoring of water quality. So we, I know that the process is that you, you're, you're, the, the scientists go in and, and assess the streams and, and the water quality, and then you, you, uh, your agricultural advisors would then go in to, to support farmers in implementing measures. Is the, what, what level of monitoring takes place after that you know, to see that those uh, measures are actually having an effect? Yeah, so I suppose, look, at the, the ultimate um, monitoring body for water quality, is, as, as I'm sure most people know, is, is the EPA. So, you know, it's the EPA um, status that they report on every three years uh, will give the, like that's, that's the one that matters really, you know, whatever other bit of monitoring that's been done um, will, will help paint a picture, but ultimately it's the EPA's um, report, our EPA analysis and, and sampling and, and their report that comes out next, uh, I think there's one due actually in the next wee while. Mm-hmm. Um, so that will, that will indicate where we are with it. But, you know, I know from the, uh, the indicators report for 2020, that, you know, the, the comment in, the, in it in relation to ASA was that, was that uh, well, in relation to PAAs, was that where uh, there was engagement in PAAs, uh, that there was a, a greater level of improvement uh, in water quality than in non-PA areas. Now, that is down to a number of factors. Local authorities are also working in PAAs. You know, there's other people working in PAAs. So there's a number of factors there. So I suppose maybe we'll get a little bit more clarity or a bit more, bit more um, information on that from the EPA in the next report as to what they think it's down to. But look at, I suppose, my point of view, um, what we're seeing is is uh, good farmer engagement. We're seeing that they're willing to do things. We're seeing that they need help. We're seeing that it involves a very intense advisory interaction. You know, both both Emer Connery and, and Body Fitzgerald and Terry were saying to me that 
you know, it 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 was four, three, four, five visits out in the out in the deal there to get things done, and it's you know the twelve months in now, and and you know it's 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 only getting going now. So that's the kind of level of engagement and intensity that's required to 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 realise farmer um, to get, get to get measures in, and then you know the knock on benefits then for water quality should follow. And it's it's the long term buy in, I guess. Yeah. That's that's. Is it is as a result of that engagement as well? Um, because yeah. sometimes people would say, "Well, why don't you just regulate all of this?" And uh, but I mean, you you have you have shorter term responses as a result. Uh, we we know that. Pass some really excellent questions coming. Yeah, in and and uh, invite more. Uh, just I suppose one or a theme around a number of questions around farmer engagement. And one specific one for Loch Enwell. Uh, were the measures all voluntary or uh, the, were the farmers given any payment? And there's a number of other questions around the extent of, of farmer engagement uh, with the, the, the process. Yeah, so I suppose it was, uh, for, for the dye search and uh, lock-in, um, the majority of it is, is voluntary, uh, but I kind of broke it down into, into kind of the regulatory ones and the voluntary ones, if you remember in the, in the, in the thing. So, so like, look at, you know, we, we, there is a role there for reminding farmers of their obligations under with regards to regulations and you know that 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 goes without saying but then there has been farmers that have gone above and beyond so you know fencing off and putting in in solar power drinkers and things like that 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 um i know they were looking for funding for it and uh, i'm not sure that every farmer that uh was to fence off has gotten has gotten financial compensation. I think some might have. I, I I'm actually not 100 sure on that, but I know there was an application gone in for funding. But I think most of the work was voluntary. Uh, some of the solar power drinkers and that are quite expensive kit, so I think there was an application gone in for funding there. And I think some of them might have gotten funding in that. So I apologies, I can't give a definite answer on that, but. Um, and then there's a there's an in engagement as well. There's a question for Joe there. How many farmers or percentage are participating in the different dairy initiatives, and is a big enough incentive uh, to implement the measures? Well, I think we're on the beginning of a journey, and we will see the the sustainability payment system strengthen over the course of the next two years because, in relation to kind of trying to support the, our the challenges macro and trying to support best practice across all the different challenges. And so I think we are going to see that moving from the kind of the, the, the initial steps that, that have just been taken onto a, a stronger and a more fulsome uh, approach. Uh, and also we're going to need kind of verification that stuff has been done uh, in order to demonstrate to regulators that when we say we do stuff, that it does happen. And then that the science will be able to track it and pick it up when, when those changes are made. So I think that in relation to the stuff that the Department of Agriculture is doing in relation to the cap restructuring and in relation to the acres and in relation to the signpost farms and in relation to what the co-ops are doing, that it requires all those different things to step up a level or two. And that's what we're going to see over the course of the next two years in particular, as we move in the next few months to, 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 to implementation, which will start light it will get to medium and then it will ramp up fully because all change management programs take the, that sort of approach. Uh, and that's what that's the journey we're currently on. The, the next day, it will be all about sustainability and, it, and Ireland will inevitably and without question, will we'll get to that, that, uh, that outcome by, 2020, by 2030, where the 25% will have been delivered and where water quality will have been fixed. That's where we've got to get to. Question, a follow on question. Does the team agree with the comments from the Department of Housing on Wednesday that dairy processors benefit uh, from farmers' environmental sustainability, particularly when marketing products abroad and therefore should be providing greater economic returns uh, and farm level advice on sustainability and nitrates reduction to, to, to farmers? Well, I think it is fair to say that we that that, that actually that while we have gotten into markets on the back of, a of our green image and so on and so forth, um, international markets do not give extra money uh, for sustainability reform. Um, and that is kind of continuing to be the position in relation to all of the markets that the, the dairy sector is in. There is not a sustainability premium paid for, uh, for, for any product on the back of sustainability reform. 
Okay. Uh, uh, there's a question there in, in relation to solar panels. Uh, do, do the solar power pumps take uh, drinking water uh, uh, from the protected river? Yeah, sure. Like they, they, they need a source uh, for water, so so they would be piped. They would, typically, what you have is is you have um, have it sited that the unit itself sited in close proximity to the to the river, and you'd have the trough maybe sited that little bit farther away. Or you know, they, they they're they're quite powerful. They can pump water for you know quite a distance. So you know, it, they're they're quite a very useful tool on a farm but they are expensive and uh, you know they have a bit of piping a bit of work to be done with them to to install them but typically they will be taking it out of the river that they're beside yeah one, one of our um, viewers here is questioning the sustainability measures being brought out by the co-ops uh, says when you are getting rewarded for buying fertilizer and not rewarded for not buying or buying less fertilizer one would have to question the credibility of the initiatives have to buy it only from uh, your own milk processor further weakens the bona fides of these payments. Biodiversity loss is not being addressed by the payments, which means as farmers, we will continue to struggle to send out a positive message. And I know Donald or Joe, you were saying that, look, this is start of a journey, but are we are we moving quickly enough on that journey, I suppose, is, is uh, and, and, and are, we, are we on the right path based on, on the question here? Well, I think the, the one of the major improvements that can happen to water quality is that if there is a switch from a particular type of fertilizer, which is CAN, uh, to protected urea, and if we uh, and the payment scheme, scheme that you would have seen have been supporting a move to the use of protected urea, which is going to have very beneficial impacts on both water and on climate change. So that's actually a very impactful and a right initiative, in my view. Um, so all of these kind of right initiatives are, are going to be strengthened and accelerated over time, uh, and we are at the beginning of the journey. So just a, just a, a slightly bigger question. I'm sure you, you've considered this one, Joe. I mean, how, how do we communicate that uh, the sustainability of the products back to the consumer? And you're quite right in the saying that that, that that connection doesn't seem to be there in terms of the, the price or the uh the, the, we know that look there's a there is a cohort of of consumers that are prepared to pay a premium for organic produce uh but you know when it looks we're looking at the the, the other products that are on the shelves how can we uh create that linkage there for for consumers to have confidence that the, the products that they're buying are are being produced in in a sustainable way and that the farmers are being rewarded for that well i think the first thing to understand is obviously is that the system of production in Ireland, which is based on the grass-based system of cows going out to grass so many days a year uh, in a very kind of ordinary and natural, which we think is kind of in Ireland, we think that that's the only way that that you know that 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 dairy is done. Whereas in other countries, cows are kept like chickens <laughs> in a shed, uh, and their food is brought into them, and their slurry is taken away, and it it's kind of like battery cows, uh, in effect, in a lot, of, in a lot of parts of the world. Our system is not like that. It is very natural, actually. In fact, and and that's what kind of board B have been communicating across the world, that because of the temperate climate that we have, which is which grows grass, uh, and which where cows can be out uh, and feeding and in a very natural way, and then turning what is a, you know an inedible product, which is grass into food, which is just incredible. I, I mean, I keep like being blown away by the efficacy of, of the cow to be able to do all this stuff. Whereas if you were to do that by mechanical means, if you were to take grass, for example, and try to turn it into some food, the amount of energy and carbon stuff that you'd have to do in life cycle analysis would just be strange um, and, and just wouldn't stack up. But this is the particular gift that both Ireland and New Zealand have. Uh, and so I think Board B have done a great job of communicating that, but consumers are not going to pay extra for it. That's kind of so, that's been the position so far. Okay, thanks, thanks, Joe. A few other questions. Uh, Noel, I suppose a, a, a quite a specific question uh, in relation to engagement with uh, farmers who have rented land as opposed to, to own land, and I suppose the increasing feature of, of uh, Irish agriculture. 
Uh, so have you noticed differences between it and how have you tackled it? Yeah, so I suppose that there's, it's a very good question. Um, I suppose it, the, there's the, the kind of the con acre system or the 11 month system where, where farmers are, are renting it and they don't know whether they're going to have it next year and then you have the more long term leases. So I suppose the more long term leases, it's, it's more straightforward because a farmer knows that um, if there are measures going in, that they're going to be there for a while so they can plan ahead. I suppose where we did meet a lot of problems was where a farmer would be renting a bit of ground, for example, we go back to the solar power drinkers or the fencing off of water courses in particular, uh, and we, we, have, we have data to back this up, um, that you know where, where ground is rented, farmers are, are much on the 11 month system or the conic system, they're much, they won't put in any features for us because they don't know, there's no security, they don't know whether they're going to be there or not the following year. Um, and, you know, I suppose typically what you have is maybe uh, elderly, elderly landowners or, or maybe uh, landowners that could be uh, in, you know, in Dublin or Galway or whatever and, and, and detach that a little bit and not showing that much interest in it. So, you know, they're, they're, they are reluctant in that situation to put in features. So it is something that we are aware of. And, you know, part of the reason why we, we've, we've managed to get some funding from the government uh, with regards to water quality EIP. So that that can go in not at the expense of, of the guy that's uh, on the on the short term rent um, can go in and be there for, for the benefit of the next person or the person after, as the case may be. I think a, a key question, and I suppose a, 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 a simple, straightforward question, but I might broaden it. Do all Chagas advisors know about ASAP and do they buy into its objectives? And I suppose broadening that out to the role of ASAP beyond the, the PAAs working with other advisors and the same with the co-op advisors in relation to uh, influencing others within the co-ops uh, in relation to their objectives. So I suppose a question for both of you. Yeah, so like, yeah, I think it's a very good question. Um, we, have a, we have a large body of work to do to get this more mainstream. You know, um, everybody that's involved in agriculture, you, you know, you'd want to be head under a rock, not to know that water quality is, is a big issue with regards to farming. Um, so, you know, every, everybody should be aware of those problems. Are they, um, are they aware of, of, of kind of the, the principles around catchment science and management? Are they aware of, of uh, all the tools that are there? Are they aware of, aware of the mitigation action and would they be able to uh, recommend them? I would say no, but they should be aware that they can contact their ASAP advisor in, in we're, we're, we're in each of the regions throughout Chagask um, and advisors through in each region uh, you know th that's your first stop if you do have a, have an issue but certainly they should have a, a, an awareness of, of work quality problems but there is a challenge there for not and it was part of one of the recommendations actually from the expert group how do we uh, mainstream this more how do we upskill the broader advisory service how do we get it embedded in the farm visit so if you're going out visiting your farm and you want to talk about grassland management and breeding, um, you know, environment issues should be one of the two or three things you talk to a farmer every time you go out, you know, be it biodiversity or greenhouse gases or water quality. They should be part of that call that, that you were making, not just not just grassland management, not just breeding, not just, you know, whatever else you're talking about, it should be embedded that way. So I think that's where we need to get to. Joe? In the yeah, I think this is the big task for us really, is to mainstream the system of production of agri-production that we have for tillage and dairy and beef and to get it to to move from being uh, efficient and effective and productive into sustainable production to scientific standard um, across those particular pillars that i mentioned earlier so that is kind of the big challenge for us all now as a, as, as a society and as an agri-society is to move to sustainable production and for it to be mainstreamed and embedded and normal, not something that you pay extra for. Okay, we're we're just out of time, I'm afraid. Um, look, I want to say thank you, Joe and and Noel, for excellent presentations and and bringing this, keeping this uh, really important topic uh, right up on the agenda. Uh, and look, we we will keep getting regular updates from you as as, as uh, time goes on. So they just just Noel, the the cycle of the ASAP program. Where where are we at now? Um, so we were we were tied with the with the river basin management plan cycles. So cycle two ended at the start of 2020 or at the end of 2021. So the next cycle ends at the end of 2027. So ASUP has uh, been extended. So again, I want to thank the, the our funding departments for 
uh, providing the funding for us to extend us to the end of 2027. Uh, so that's where we're at with it. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Noel. And Pat, thanks very much for helping with questions. Um, just to remind everybody that there is going to be a major organic beef open day taking place uh, on Wednesday, the 28th of September in Cashel County Tipperary. So our organic colleagues have asked us to just remind uh, viewers of that event. Uh, full details are available on the Chagas website. And next week, we're going to be joined by Professor Tia Hennessy and Tracy Bradfield, who are going to be talking about farmers' attitudes to results-based contracts. Um, and that, that takes place next Friday. Um, special thanks to Yvonne uh, Maher for helping out in the background today, and also to Andy Boland uh, on the production of the series. And uh, so until next week, we will talk to you then and uh, have a, enjoy the weekend. I hope we're having a little bit more fine weather for the weekend. Uh, so thanks again, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks.